hospitalized and undergoing a psychiatric evaluation. Friends, today we have the case of LaShawn Harris in San Francisco, California. Was she just a moron or was she actually suffering? I'm going to start with her background. Her family members recalled LaShawn was a sweet, happy and fun-loving child who had good relationships with her family members and her friends. LaShawn became actively religious around the age of 15 attending church and Bible study on a regular basis. LaShawn became pregnant with Treshawn when she was only 15 years old. Although her mother was very upset about the pregnancy, LaShawn was happy about it and wanted to keep the baby. LaShawn's family consistently described her as a good mother who was very attached to and protective of her children. From February 2003, until April 2004, LaShawn lived with her children in an apartment managed by the Oakland Housing Authority. According to this housing authority, LaShawn kept her apartment extremely clean and her children were clean and well behaved. She was gentle and attentive towards her children. The children's paternal grandmother said LaShawn was like a daughter to her and she was a beautiful mother who maintained a loving relationship with her children. According to LaShawn's cousin, the father of LaShawn's children was really present and would be abusive towards LaShawn and the kids whenever he was around. However, LaShawn's mother first noticed changes in LaShawn's behavior and appearance in December 2003. Her appearance was unkempt, she seemed withdrawn, she would sometimes pace the floor and she began to make unintelligible references to spiritual warfare and other religious subjects and was reporting hearing God's voice. She was hospitalized after trying to go out an upstairs window in her aunt's room. Are you starting to see a theme? God, hallucinations, trying to jump out of a window, something isn't right. LaShawn's mother was scared at her behavior and had her hospitalized three times by the end of March 2004. The doctors told Miss Harris LaShawn had schizophrenia but no one explained the diagnosis to her. Several relatives also mentioned her strained behaviors during the year of 2004. And it was in May 2005, LaShawn and her children went to Florida to live with one of her sisters. In June, LaShawn was hospitalized in Florida where she was prescribed an antipsychotic medication. Believing her illness had gotten worse, LaShawn's mother went to Florida in July to bring her and her children back to California. She was hospitalized again in July after she returned to California. At the hospital, she was diagnosed with a psychotic disorder not otherwise specified. She was released with instructions to discontinue the antipsychotic medication. LaShawn's last psychiatric intervention occurred on August 11th, 2005. Concerned by LaShawn's behavior, her mother called the Alameda County Mobile Crisis Unit and requested she be examined. They determined that she was not imminently suicidal or a danger to others and could not be involuntarily committed. Then LaShawn and her children went to live at the Salvation Army Family Shelter in August 2005. She received $687 per month in public assistance. Per month, that's peanuts. The social services manager at the shelter stated LaShawn was more responsible than many of the parents staying at the shelter. She brought her children to breakfast and dinner on time every day. She took Treshawn to school every day and made sure he attended the shelter's homework club every night. Now we're going to go on to October the 19th 2005 and we're going to have a look at what actually happened. On that day LaShawn threw her three young children Treshawn, who was age 6, Taranta, who was age 2, and Joshua, who was age 1, into 
the San Francisco Bay from Pier 7, causing them to drown. LaShawn, who had previously been hospitalized and treated for mental illness, later told police she heard voices beginning the night before. These voices told her to drown her children at the pier in order to send them to God as a living sacrifice. The Coast Guard found Toronto's body later that evening on the shoreline near the entrance to the Golden Gate Yacht Club. An autopsy revealed Toronto had drowned, and despite a two-week search, the bodies of the other children were never found. A witness was sitting with his two young sons on a bench near the end of Pier 7 in San Francisco at approximately 5.15pm on October the 19th. When he arrived at the end of Pier 7, he saw LaShawn and her three children. She was chasing the oldest child and taking off his clothes. The child was shouting, no mommy, no mommy. Another child was sitting on a bench and a third child was either in the stroller or on the bench. LaShawn caught up with the oldest child, Treshawn, and brought him back to the bench when she removed all of its clothing. Standing one or two feet from the railing, LaShawn picked Treshawn up by one arm and one leg and swung him three or four times before letting him go over the railing into the water. He was shouting, no mommy, no mommy, continuously as LaShawn was swinging him. As soon as Treshawn went over the railing, the witness grabbed his children and started to walk back toward the shore. He continued to look back as he was walking, seeing LaShawn removing the clothing from her second oldest child and starting to swing him over the railing. The witness did not see Toronto go over the railing because he was using his cell phone to dial 911. San Francisco police officers Michael White and Tom Johnson arrived at the pier at around 5.30 p.m. The witness joined them in their patrol car and they started to drive toward the end of the pier. About a quarter or a third of the way down the pier, they encountered LaShawn pushing a baby stroller. She was walking, looking straight ahead. She appeared calm and emotionless and made no attempt to flee. The stroller contained children's clothing, shoes, diapers, but no children. When he asked her a second time where she had put her babies, she responded that they were with their father and that they are okay. Officer Johnson asked her if she threw her children into the water and she said, yes, I did. The officers placed her under arrest and handcuffed her. Other officers, including a marine unit, arrived to search for the children. Videotapes of LaShawn's interview by homicide inspectors Dan Everson and Dennis Mayfee were played for the jury during the trial. When asked at the start of the interview, how did your day start that morning, she said, I heard voices in my head. She explained that the beginning on the evening of October 18th, 2005, so the day before, she heard a voice telling her to give Jesus her baby. She said it was like spiritual warfare. LaShawn stated it was either her life or her kids' lives, and the voices told her to give kids as a living sacrifice. LaShawn recalled that when she woke that morning, the voices told her to get dressed and take her children to the pier before leaving for San Francisco. LaShawn went to her cousin Tawanda's house in Oakland and told Tawanda that she was going to take her kids to the lake and throw them over. When LaShawn was asked why she told her cousin about this, she said, I don't know. I heard a spiritual warfare, I guess. I don't know voices confused minds. LaShawn recalled Tawanda told her not to do it. It was wrong and that she was going to call the police. When asked if this was the first time she heard voices, LaShawn responded, no, it's not. I was, I went to the hospital two times before that, but the spiritual warfare voices and stuff I did use, take stuff, Haldol and stuff like that. It's pretty clear her interview with the police was quite incoherent. LaShawn later told the police that she had been hospitalized in Florida the previous summer and that she had been to the John George Psychiatric Pavilion in San Leandro three times and was last seen at John George in July 2005 because she heard voices again. After leaving Tawanda's house, LaShawn took her children to San Francisco, arriving in San Francisco around 9 a.m. They walked to Pier 7. LaShawn remembered this pair from a visit a long time ago. 
She told the inspectors she took the children to Pier 39 about 3 p.m. and bought them hot dogs from a street vendor. They returned to Pier 7 where they walked around and her children played and watched people fishing. While at Pier 7, LaShawn was hearing the voices in her head telling her, throw them in. LaShawn said she also thought of offering herself as a living sacrifice and she could have and should have but did not why she did not. LaShawn recalled when she began throwing her kids in the water, she started with the oldest and ended with the youngest. She took their clothing off because that was what the voices told her to do. When she attempted to take off Treshawn's clothing, he said, No, what are you doing? No, Mama, no. LaShawn also heard Joshua crying and Toronto saying, Mama, no. She then threw Treshawn into the water. He was screaming, No, before he went into the water. LaShawn saw him hit the water and thought she should not have done it. Taranta also cried out, No mama, no, and tried to fight back as she undressed him. Asked whether Joshua said anything while she was undressing Taranta, LaShawn responded, No, he's a little baby. He probably didn't know any better. LaShawn thought she might be doing the wrong thing, but did it for Jesus. When asked why Jesus would want her to put Taranta in the water, she said, You never know how he's going to call who he wants. This idea made her mad and Toronto struggled with her and made her think what she was doing was wrong. After throwing Toronto in the water, LaShawn undressed Joshua and threw him in too. He laughed while being undressed and tried to hold onto her. This made her think it might be wrong to throw him into the water because she did it due to the voices. After throwing her children in the water, LaShawn walked around the pier crying because she loved her kids and if she wasn't called to send her kids, she wouldn't have sent them. LaShawn admitted she assumed the children would drown when she threw them in the water. She knew none of them would swim. When asked how she felt when the kids went into the water, she said, One minute I think I did what I was told to do and God ordered my steps. I tried to follow them if he did. Then it was my, you know, the next minute it was like my kids, man. I love my kids. She said her kids were gone but they'll live in her heart. Near the end of the interview, LaShawn asked the inspectors if they were going to kill her. They asked her, what do you mean? She said, well I did murder. I threw my babies over there. So from everything I've told you so far, it's pretty clear something is not right up here. So during the trial, psychologists were interviewed. Dr. Paul Good, a clinical and forensic psychologist, was retained by the defense to interview and evaluate LaShawn. He conducted 13 hours of interviews with her and performed a standard battery of psychological and intelligence tests. Dr. Good concluded LaShawn suffers from paranoid schizophrenia. Her IQ tested at 70 at the bottom of the borderline range. According to Dr. Good, LaShawn's schizophrenia manifested itself in her delusional belief that she had a special relationship with God and in auditory hallucinations, God was speaking to her. Dr. Good testified the hallucinations in a schizophrenic may be command auditory hallucinations. They could be a voice commanding or directing a person to do something that often makes the person feel helpless and dependent on the voice. In Dr. Good's opinion, LaShawn suffered from the command auditory hallucination that God told her he wanted her children which she experienced as an order from God and she felt called by this command. He interviewed her at length on October the 19th, 2005 and LaShawn told Dr. Good she heard God's voice the night before the event and when she woke up at 6am, God told her that he needed the children. God told her to take them to Tuanda's house. God told her to go to the pier, undress the children and throw them in the bay at 5pm. He also thought it was significant LaShawn was so divorced from reality when she was at the pier, she was unaware people were nearby and watching her. Her statement to police explaining her children were okay and were with their father was also consistent with her delusion. In his view, LaShawn understood in only a very limited sense that God was asking her to kill her children. Someone who is not delusional would define death as the cessation of life. But for LaShawn, Death was simply a way of conveyance to heaven, which she believed was a real place in which her children would still be alive. She told Dr. Good she believed they were chasing dogs, going to school, living in a house 
and possibly being taken care of by their great grandmother or by God. She spoke of heaven as a real concrete place. In the trial, the defense also called as a witness Dr. Gilbert Villela, who treated LaShawn at San Francisco General Hospital following her arrest. He also labeled her a paranoid schizophrenic. He reported she was experiencing visual as well as auditory hallucinations. She saw the Virgin Mary at a hospital in Florida and saw Jesus and Jehovah on a bus during her return trip from Florida. Dr. Villela testified that LaShawn spoke of heaven as being an actual place. During her hospitalization, LaShawn wrote a card to God, which she asked hospital staff to deliver to heaven. Based on his assessment, interviews of LaShawn, and the letter, Dr. Villela said that LaShawn believed putting her children in the bay was the mode of transportation to heaven, a place that was as real as New York City. During one of her interviews with Dr. Villela, LaShawn recounted that sometime before the events on October the 19th, God had told her to jump out of a window, but she did not jump because she did not want her children to be without her. Villela testified that after a few weeks of taking antipsychotic medications at San Francisco General Hospital, LaShawn reported the voices in her head were going away and she began to question God on whether she should have followed his commands regarding her children. This caused her to become very depressed about what she had done. She expressed a wish that she would die and go to heaven with her children. Then, psychologist Dr. Ronald Roberts and psychiatrist Dr. Jose Maldonado testified as experts for the prosecution's rebuttal. On cross-examination, defense counsel played part of Roberts' interview of Love Sean in which she told him she knew you had to die to get to heaven. She added she used to think a person could get to heaven by plane. Dr. Maldonado also interviewed LaShawn for about three hours. He testified that when LaShawn threw her children into the bay, she did so knowing they would drown and die. And this was part of her plan to sacrifice her children's lives so they would go to heaven. Dr. Maldonado said that LaShawn understood death meant the cessation of life and noted she referred to herself as a murderer during the interview and stated many times she murdered her children. He said that even if LaShawn sometimes referred to the incident as delivering her children to God, she understood it meant killing them. Dr. Maldonado believed LaShawn has a clear understanding of the permanence of death. When he asked her whether it was hard to make the choice to kill her children, she said, it was very hard because I will lose them forever, which is interesting because she knew the consequences of her actions. The doctor said he saw no contradiction between LaShawn knowing her children were going to die a permanent death in the bay, yet believing they would be alive in heaven. He did not dispute that she believed her children went to heaven after their deaths, but found it unclear whether that belief was a product of her delusions or merely part of her Christian beliefs. He said if she wants to believe that her children are in heaven and that they are playing and that they are safe, that could be the reaction information which is things we invent in our head to make us feel better about what's going on. It could be part of the delusion or it could be her religious beliefs. According to Maldonado, many non-delusional, non-psychotic people hold idiosyncratic beliefs about heaven, including there are streets and light poles and dogs and people married. Which is actually interesting because I do believe in heaven and hell, but when I think of heaven and hell, I can only think of it in my mind from an earth point of view. Like if heaven is going to be this warm, sunny place, well, I'm going to think of clouds and the sun, right? I cannot think beyond that. Now, on January the 16th, which is actually my birthday, in the year of 2007, she was declared criminally insane and she was sentenced to 25 years to life in a mental health facility. So my conclusion is that the sentencing is fair. I go back to the father of her children. Imagine leaving her alone with three children. What the fuck was he doing? It actually really pisses me off when I see men who abandon their kids. There's nothing more cowardly in my mind. But this isn't a story about a man abandoning his kids. This is a story of a mother who was just mentally sick. I don't think this has anything to do with her Christian beliefs. She could have believed that a triangle is a square or that sleeping with your socks on is actually a good thing to do. It doesn't matter what the belief was. To me, it was how she took the belief and made it into something else. Either way, what a sad story for these three children. Thank you for watching.